Hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Keeping Your Sign Business Open and Operating. Thank you to Reese Supply and Reese University for uh, having us here to give this presentation and to offering all their webinars this week uh, during this th these critical times. And I just wanted to reiterate what Samantha said. Make sure you ask questions via the chat box throughout the presentation when they come to you. And then we will try to answer them at the end of the presentation. Like I said, I'm David Hickey with the International Sign Association. And for today's presentation, I'll have my colleagues Alicia Auerswald and Kenny Peskin on with me. For those of you who aren't familiar with what the ISA Advocacy Department does, let me just quickly fill you in. First of all, we have three people on our ISA Advocacy team. There's myself, David Hickey, I'm the Vice President of Advocacy. Kenny Peskin is our Director of Industry Programs. Kenny grew up in the sign business, and now we help sign companies deal with sign code, technical, and regulatory issues. He's been daily tracking the state and local shutdown orders and has a unique perspective on how sign companies need to comply with these shutdown orders and what they can do to stay open for business. We also have James Carpentier. He's our Director of State and Local Affairs. James is a certified planner by trade and brings valuable insight in our outreach to the planning community. Those are the local government officials, of course, who draft sign regulations for counties, cities, towns, and villages. And we have three main initiatives with ISA advocacy that are targeted to helping sign and graphics companies such as yourselves. First, we offer free sign code and permitting advice for our member sign companies. If a sign and graphic company is a member of uh, an ISA affiliated association, they are automatically members of ISA. And therefore, we are there for them as a complimentary resource on any sort of sign code issues or, or permitting issues, or variances that they need help with. Uh, we also have an extensive outreach program to educate planners. Uh, and our goal in educating planners is to help them come up with reasonable and beneficial sign codes. We do this through day-long workshops called Planning for Sign Code Success. We offer webinars to planners We've really been focusing on this the past few years, and uh, every year we reach hundreds, if not uh, over a thousand planners representing hundreds of communities across the country, and they get to hear about how to have effective and enforceable sign regulations straight from the sign industry. And our third initiative is working on technical issues. This is Kenny's forte. This is working with Underwriters uh, Laboratories, UL, working on the national electric code every three years to represent the sign industry's concerns and working on electrical issues including with um, ahjs and other local enforcement folks who deal with electrical issues and signs all of which contribute to isa advocacy's overall goal which is to facilitate a regulatory environment in which the sign industry can protect and grow its business so this has been our purpose for as long as I've been with ISA, and I think we've done a pretty good job at it, considering there is a, an ingrained prejudice against signs and relatively widespread ignorance about their value to businesses and communities, not to mention there are over 30,000 local jurisdictions in the United States, each with their own unique sign code. But things really started to change in early March with state emergencies being declared across the country and by march 17th we started seeing state shutdowns and stay-at-home orders to the extent that we see on this map and as you can see only a few states have not yet enacted shutdowns of one form or another and i imagine that most of you are in these red or yellow states and conduct business in these states now of the over 40 states with stay-at-home orders, a strong majority, I think, 33, based their shutdown orders, who can stay open or who must close on guidelines from the federal government. And they come from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or 
CISA, which is under the purview of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. The CISA guidance, which first came out on March 18th, identifies, quote, the critical infrastructure sectors and the essential workers needed to maintain the services and functions Americans depend on daily and that need to be able to operate resiliently during the COVID-19 pandemic response. CISA identified 16 sectors of critical infrastructures, which you see here, which are broken into, I think by now over 200 occupational groupings. And as I just alluded to, some states adapt entirely this federal CISA list. Others add more jobs or businesses to the federal list. And a handful of states develop their own list uh, that may differ greatly. Now, when these CISA guidelines first came out in mid-March, and then they were updated on March 28th, they did not include the sign industry as critical infrastructure. And as more and more of these states implemented their own shutdowns, they did not, they also did not specifically include the sign industry as an essential business, except for Maryland. And if you notice the terminology, the terminology that's been used, you'll notice that CISA uses the terms critical infrastructure and critical workforce but the states are implementing their shutdown orders using nomenclature like essential business or essential services, and in states like Pennsylvania, life-sustaining businesses. So for about a month, as all this was going down, the sign industry was left in sort of a legal limbo where we were not included as critical infrastructure or essential business, but we weren't being specifically excluded either. For example, when states did specifically shut down non-essential businesses, they included establishments like movie theaters, gyms, barbers, many kinds of retailers, but not sign companies. So within this framework, we've had to make our case that the sign and graphics industry enables these critical infrastructures and essential businesses to operate. You look at what is traditionally considered to be quote unquote, critical infrastructure, you know, top level, health, health facilities, emergency services, transportation systems. These three main critical infrastructures definitely need signs and graphics, especially during these uncertain and ever-changing times. Then you have essential businesses within kinds of critical infrastructures like food management and financial and commercial facilities. And, you, and then you recognize typical sign industry customers like groceries and pharmacies, banks and restaurants, all of which need signs to communicate with the public. And further down, states are considering what we might consider to be somewhat less urgent businesses to be considered essential. And of course, they all use signs and graphics as a key way to let the public know that they're there and they're open, you know, all the way from pet supplies to laundromats, liquor stores, and in some cases out west, even cannabis dispensaries. Now, ISA has been advising sign companies over the last month to emphasize this connection between their business and their essential business customers if they want to stay open. In, my, in our opinion, there's definitely reasonable leeway for sign companies to stay open and continue operating to an extent. You may not have been an essential business by definition, but you are in practice. You enable essential businesses to operate as effectively as possible. In the meantime, ISA was working with CISA officials to get the sign industry officially included in their guidelines to confirm the importance of visual communications in critical infrastructure and for essential businesses. We went back and forth for weeks. So we were pleased that when CISA guidelines 3.0 came out last Friday, they included some new critical infrastructure including manufacturer and distributors of, quote, specialized signage and structural systems, printers, and printed materials. That's the third bullet point on the bottom on, on this page. So here we are now officially, the federal government in their advisory guidelines, it's not a law, it's not a mandate, 
They are more recommendations or guidelines, but still vitally important that the federal government through the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Secu uh, Security Agency has now included design and graphics industry as part of our nation's critical infrastructure. <clears throat> now this doesn't solve all the problems for sign companies. So the rest of this section of our presentation is gonna go on what sign companies still need to do to make sure that they can stay open and operating to an extent. And one of the things that is an option is the waiver process. And I'm gonna, and Kenny Peskin is gonna jump in for this. Hello everyone, um, I'm Kenny Peskin, also from ISA. Thank you, David. Um, so as, as David mentioned, uh, of the 40 plus states with shutdowns, not everyone relies on that federal list. Um, and in addition, because sign companies were not explicitly included in the earlier versions of that federal CISA guidance, um, there are locations in which a sign company may have been forced to close um, or may have been operating uh, in a reduced capacity because certain um, certain uh, production focus or other types of operations may have been considered non-essential and, and subject to a shutdown. And one of the things that a number of these states have done, more than a dozen, is to formally, excuse me, formally um, explain some type of waiver process whereby a sign company can either apply um, for a formal designation they can remain open or obtain clarification um, if the language is somewhat confusing or contradictory and are trying to determine whether or not they fit um, within those criteria. Um, for example, Texas um, is a state that outlined a formal waiver process um, designated a particular office or agency within the state government, provided a, a web form for submission um, and an email address um, to try and obtain a response. In, in contrast, um, a state like uh, Missouri um, in their state executive order outlined that the agency can add um, exemptions, but didn't really clarify how one would go about that. And so um, in a in a situation where it's still unclear whether whether your company's operations fit within that designation that David read about manufacturers and distributors of specialized signage and structural systems, printers and printed materials um, in in uh, in more than a quarter of the country, there is a formal process um, to make that determination. David? Thanks, Kenny. And I just want to make clear that if you are in one of these states and you think that you do need to apply for a waiver, please consult with ISA as you're filling out this application. So we've been able to make the compelling case that our industry helps critical infrastructure and essential businesses operate. And it's good to see the media agree with us, like this story local here to ISA in the DC area, about how sign companies are providing signs and graphics to essential businesses in the capital region. The fact of the matter is, whether we're technically or, ex or explicitly defined as such, the sign and graphics industry has clearly been essential in helping communicate critical messages to the public during the pandemic. We've also seen many communities relax enforcement of their temporary sign regulations to help their essential business constituents. This is something that ISA supports, and it's something that we recommend to local officials uh, where, wherever they are. Uh, to that end, we had a webinar a couple weeks ago for planners, 200 planners attended this webinar about temporary sign regulations in times of crisis. And many of them, uh, if they have not already relaxed enforcement of their, of their sign regulations are considering doing so. So these are positive developments uh, in the midst of this pandemic. 
All right, so let's get into what you can do, how you can use ISA resources to make sure that you can stay open and operational to an extent. And one way that you can use ISA to help on these kinds of questions and issues is to check out the resources on our website, which of course is www.science.org. This is our home page right here. And in the middle is our Business Continuity Resources Center or BCRC, which has information for that uh, signs and graphics companies need in terms of health and safety, federal and state loans, unemployment information, and HR issues, among other things. But for the purposes of this presentation, I will direct you to the essential business designation button, which is there on the right. This takes you to the essential business designation page, which right up on top has the new edition of the CISA 3.0 guidelines. And then it goes into our list of impacted states, which I'll get into in just a minute, which Kenny spent the last month daily tracking and putting together. This is a PDF document that is updated on a daily basis. As of today, it is over 40 pages long. Uh, it contains all the states that have enacted shutdowns to one degree or another in alphabetical order with the relevant parts to our industry linked and highlight, highlighted. Uh, waivers, we just talked about that. Then we have a list of next steps for sign companies, because as I mentioned, it's not quite enough that CISA considers us to be critical infrastructure or that your state isn't coming down on, isn't coming down hard on your sign shop. There are definitely additional steps that, st that sign and graphics companies need to do to stay open during the pandemic. We're talking things like a health and safety plan, identifying essential business customers, documenting business relationships, um, of which we have sample language that can be cut and pasted and, and all things that we'll get uh, into further detail coming up. We also have on this page supply chain resources, suppliers and distributors who are you know, open and in business and ready to help out. And here is the snapshot of the state and local emergency orders. Again, this is something that Kenny has we spent a lot of time putting it together. It's on our essential business page. It's specific to each state and locality. There's all sorts of helpful links and elaborations and it's updated daily as things change. And it's possible that we have seen the end of states enacting shutdowns and stay at home orders, it's possible. What we might see that we're gonna be tracking is what states are doing to um, draw back those. And we'll have some sort of updated information on that as well as we move forward. <clears throat> yeah, one of the first steps that sign and graphics companies need to do to stay open and operational is to keep safety first because it's no longer business as usual that's obvious, but it's also obvious that it's no longer workplace health and safety as usual. No government official, no member of the public, if they see this in the media, is going to tolerate you know, less than excellent safety procedures in a sign shop. So we recommend at a bare minimum, the sign and graphic companies follow SDC guidelines in their facilities, social distancing, uh, basic hygiene, shifts, uh, keeping areas clean, you know, on a, you know, every couple hours, uh, wipe downs. You also might want to check out the OSHA health and safety standards uh, for the pandemic as well. <clears throat> I also recommend that tomorrow at this same time, sta same station, we are on the, there is a Reese ISA webinar on health and safety for manufacturing facilities. Uh, ISA made this pre had this presentation a couple of weeks ago. It was fascinating, full of all sorts of useful information uh, and features an excellent industrial hygiene expert and also some input from some from a couple sign companies as well. 
and I believe there is the registration information right there. So if you have any hopes of staying open and you know being a, a good corporate citizen, make sure that you have a fantastic and vigorous health and safety plan in place. And now Kenny will be talking about how to designate essential employees. Thank you, David. Um, so, so obviously we've spent a good amount of time talking about the fact that the sign industry or sign manufacturing is now considered essential. But as all of us know, um, a number of essential businesses that have continued operating are operating under somewhat different conditions. You know, restaurants that are staying open only for carry out or delivery, um, just a, a prominent example. So it's important to understand that even though a sign company may be considered an essential business, um, compliance with those health department and CDC um, guidelines and best practices requires that a business um, evaluate and determine what is the minimum level of operations that need to occur um, simultaneously um, within the business location and, and what can be um, shifted, whether time shifted, um, whether can be um, operating uh, remotely from home or, or in another manner. So an important exercise that we can do um, is to evaluate the operations of our own companies. Um, and, and to not just say we're, we work in the sign industry, but figure out what the specific things um, that we are doing within our company, our, our normal job functions, to see uh, what of those are essential and require a presence um, in, the, in the manufacturing facility or, 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 or the warehouse, and what can be done in another manner. So right here on this list, we, we've listed um, you know, 10, 10 uh, sectors of the sign industry. And, and it's pretty, pretty clear that, you know, the bottom three or the bottom four are jobs that don't require actual uh, hands on the, on the machinery or on the trucks or, or on the signs. And those are the kinds of, of jobs that even though the business may be essential, um, would likely be operating um, remotely. And so if we focus in on only uh, only what are the, the things that need to occur um, within the shop um, or on the job site, it's important to understand how those specific jobs or job functions might tie in with the kind of language that we could see um, in the federal uh, guidance, but more importantly, in some of the state guidance. Um, because from an enforcement perspective, it's not going to be the federal government that is telling somebody they need to stop operations. It's um, the local police, it's a local health department or something like that. And so we'll see that, for example, um, in sign installation, there's language in many of the state orders that says something along the lines of construction workers who support the construction operation, inspection and maintenance of construction sites. Um, so that is language that we would see in this, uh, in these state orders that would support uh, sign installation. Later where we see uh, service work or crane operation, I know many sign companies um, rent out their cranes for installation of, of HVAC systems or flagpoles or other type things, there's often language in those, those state orders that specifically talks about building and construction tradesmen, um, specifically mentions electricians, HVAC, painting, and services that are necessary to maintaining essential businesses and operations. So those are all um, some kind of of service or maintenance. And then of course, with the fabrication, that new language on manufacturing should cover it, but businesses that sell, manufacture, or supply other essential businesses and operations with the support or materials necessary to operate. Um, in the eyes of, of many people, again, you know, the sign, the sign itself 
is not what's essential. It is the restaurant or the bank or the gas station um, that that sign is is going um, in support of. That is what is essential. So it's a matter of documenting and understanding that we're supplying other essential businesses. Kenny, if I could just jump in here really quick. Uh, the provisions regarding installers and service and maintenance are especially important because the CISA federal guidelines, which are great, that include the sign industry as, as critical infrastructure, are only for manufacturers and distributors. So, you know, that does cover the vast majority of the sign industry, but for any businesses that are specific, you know, that only do installation, that only do maintenance or a combination thereof. They're not necessarily covered by the new CISA federal uh, guidelines, but they have these these uh, safe havens um, in the existing CISA guidelines and at various state levels, uh, shut down uh, exemptions where they can uh, still keep working as construction workers or um, you know construction trade tradesmen and tradeswomen. Thank you, David. Um, so. We're going to now talk about sort of the next part of it, which is important based off of what David just said, which is um, if we're unclear about how we as a sign company um, or a service provider fit in to the essential business um, designation, it often can be important um, to document the relationships we have. Um, so it's important, you know, what are the standards for connecting those sign industry jobs and how our companies operate with, with essential business? Um, so there's language in many of those state orders that David talked about um, and in that packet uh, uh, that's available for download where we, we provide links and, and quote from all of the, very, the 40 plus state orders. We'll see patterns in the language in most of these state orders where there's language along the lines of sell, manufacture, or supply other essential businesses with support or materials, providing services that are necessary to maintain, and workers who support the supply chain. These are all things that likely apply to um, one or another um, service that your company offers. And it's important for your company to try and explain that connection to enforcement officials um, for whom it may not necessarily be clear on the surface. So within the sign industry, the types of connections that uh, we tend to have to essential businesses, there are a variety of different um, relationships. There are, are plenty of situations where an essential business is, is the customer of our local sign manufacturer or installer. We are hired on their behalf. We manufacture a sign, we install the sign, we service the sign. It's a direct connection to an essential business. But certainly um, with the advent of franchise systems and national brands, there are a lot of situations where that essential business customer um, has a direct relationship with a national sign company who then hires the local uh, installer uh, or service company. Um, and so uh, documenting that relationship, the relationship goes from the local sign company to the national sign company and then from the national sign company to the essential business. So it's a little more challenging um, to document or to, to note that structure. Additionally, um, there are times when that national sign company uh, may outsource the production of, of their signs um, to a third party wholesale fabricator. Um, and so if you're in a state with that, um, that doesn't necessarily recognize that the business you're doing is essential, that wholesale fabricator in order to keep their manufacturing facility open would have to document their connection to the national sign company who is then connected to the essential business and so on. Uh, sign supply distributors, um, their ability to keep their warehouse open is as a connection to the sign manufacturer who's working for the essential business, the component manufacturer, et cetera. But also uh, one other, um, connection that's important to designate um, is that even if you can demonstrate that your business is connected um, to an essential business, um, it's also important and may be required that 
your company designate which employees are essential in order to fulfill that work that is um, allowed under the essential business designation. So you've uh, documented um, and designated the essential manufacturing employees or the essential construction slash electrician employees um, who are distinct from your account managers or sales staff um, or graphic artists or finance people or HR people um, who may be able to work remotely. Um, and so in order to help sign companies document those business relationships, ISA has um, developed some templates um, that can help uh, that can help you uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, demonstrate how you are connected to an essential business. So obviously it's it's all but impossible to read um, the paragraphs of language here. But one of the things that this does um, is it designate it, it clearly spells out your company, um, your the individual um, who works for the company um, has been um, designated by a particular um, company who your customer that's an essential business, the type of work you're doing, quoting the language from um, the individual um, executive order in place in the state and, and why you are in fact essential. And one thing that's important is it often it's sort of below the signature field, it would contain all the appropriate information on uh, from the management of the company um, with all of the contact information if they were trying to verify the validity of that information. This is useful information um, certainly to have on files, but it's also very important um, to have available on the job site. Certainly sign companies are very visible and present um, on the business location because we're all generally working outdoors in public right out right alongside the street. Um, and it's also important information um, to have available for essential employees as they may be traveling. Um, certainly um, getting to and from work, but getting from work um, to a job site, sometimes at, at quite a distance. And in some situations, also crossing state lines. There have been a number of, of situations um, dealing with particular state executive orders where a specific state um, may restrict interstate travel. Um, I believe there was a restriction between Texas and Louisiana um, because of uh, perceptions that the population of Louisiana was, was sicker than the population of Texas. And so in order to um, possibly alleviate any concerns or problems people may have with law enforcement, having this documentation um, with the employee makes, uh, makes things run more smoothly. David? Thanks, Kenny. Now, I understand this is a lot of information, a lot of great information. So if you have any questions about it, feel free to ask them in the chat box, and we will do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation. So there are some other, uh, what I guess we would call miscellaneous issues that have to do with keeping your facility open and uh, basic uh, work tasks that go into that. For instance, there are plenty of state shutdowns, but there are also various county and city shutdown orders as well. Then you need to make sure which level of shutdown or stay at home applies to your facility and to your workforce. Traveling across state lines, Kenny just talked about this. There can be a limited ability to travel across state lines, especially when it comes to hot spots like in Louisiana. So you know, check out the rules. Uh, for the states, the governor's website usually has, has them, and verify any travel restrictions. There's also work, you know, what we, in order to stay open and operational, you can basically only do work for your essential business customers. What's going on with your, with your non-essential customers? You know, even if you're staying open and operational, how are you dealing with them? Uh, is it just, um, is it just uh, paperwork? Is it just getting projects lined up for when to reopen, those are things that you need to consider. And then there's manufacturing safety and health products. Now you've heard and read about the need for personal protective equipment or PPEs across the country. 
Many manufacturers, including those in the sign industry, are refitting their capacities to produce PPEs to help fill gaps where needed. If your sign and graphics company is making PPEs, that will go a long way in keeping that shop open and employees working. But let me just emphasize, it does not reduce the need for that facility to have a tight safety and health program. That is still imperative. Now on the screen we have our our, B, our BR right, BCRC page, uh, specifically about emergency supply production, where we are collecting stories of signing graphics companies making products to protect the the public. Uh, we're trying to tell the industry story because that is your story also. So if you want to be a part of the story, please. If you if your signing graphics company is contributing. Uh, in this way, you can email right there and give us your story and we'll, we'll do what we can to, to help publicize that. <clears throat> Oops, excuse me. I think we have a, a poll now, Alicia. Yep, we do. Uh, okay, you can see it on the right-hand side. Okay, on your right hand side, what has been your experience with federal loans? We've been talking about how you can stay open and operational, but there are obviously serious financial implications and ramifications that are going on. And there are uh, various federal loans that have been available in the aftermath of the, of the, sh of the shutdowns and the pandemic. So if you wouldn't mind just letting us know, have you applied for any federal loans or not? Uh, have you applied and received funding? Have you applied and received some feedback but still not received funding? Um, have, did you apply for the PPP or for the EDO loans and not heard back at all? So I'll just give you a few more seconds to check that out and then we'll see what the results are. All right, looks like not apply for any federal loans is the winner at 37 percent a quarter 25 percent apply for federal loans and receive funding but if you add up not receive funding that is 37 percent all right so let's talk about these federal loans for a little bit first uh the the cares act was the 2.3 trillion dollar bill that congress passed and the president signed into law a couple of weeks ago uh that contained the the famous uh, Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP program, but it also contains some tax policies there that should uh, that should benefit signs and graphics companies to an extent. It's you know any way that can that can help uh, is 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 here. And let me just say first of all that this is not legal or financial advice. Please talk with your accountant or your attorney when it comes to these these tax policies and how they affect your business. Uh, but it looks like they, these are ways that signs and graphics companies can take advantage of to, to protect their business and their employees uh, as much as possible. We're talking about things like delaying payment of the employer payroll taxes between now and the, uh, the end of the year, um, even going even uh, further delays in 2021 and 2022. You have uh, tax changes when it comes to net operating losses uh, that can be carried back five years. This extends now to uh, pass-throughs and, and S-Corps, which are a majority of sign and graphics companies. So that is that is positive. And there, there are other tax changes as, as well that are that were enacted, hopefully, to help small businesses. And those might help around the edges. A little bit but i think what everyone is mostly concerned about are the federal loans including the paycheck protection act so if you look at this as of last week last thursday 340 billion dollars was allocated to 1.6 million businesses in the united states to help with uh, payroll retaining employees rent utilities and other operating expenses. Uh, if you look at this information that the Small Business Administration put out in terms of approved loans and how many billions were allocated, 
I think that sign and graphics companies would most likely fall under the construction or manufacturing NAICS codes, 285,000 approved loans under those two NAICS codes for over 85 billion. But of course, only a small sliver of that has likely gone to sign and graphics companies. Uh, in addition to the poll we just had, I've heard from members who applied and got their funding and others who have not. ISA provided a webinar recently in partnership with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce on the CARES Act and what it means for your business, specifically the Paycheck Protection Program. And I believe that you can download the recording on our website. And of course, I think everyone's heard in one way or another that these PPP funds dried up as of late last week. And although Congress saw that these funds were being quickly depleted a couple of weeks ago, it took 14 days for these funds to be completely um, used, Congress is still haggling over the next steps to provide more funding. But the latest reports are that there is another $310 billion in PPP funding coming this week. We will be communicating the news if and when it happens. In the meantime, get your documentation ready and line up your lender if you have not already. You can find the data you'll need to compile on our website, on our BCRC, in addition to a link where you can find a lender if you aren't using your usual bank. Because if Congress replenishes these funds to the tune of 310 billion, it's gonna go fast and you're gonna to need to get back at it once we get those new funds. Another loan that sign and graphics companies can take advantage of are the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, or EDL. Uh, these are loans that have very reasonable terms to them. You look at 3.75% 30-year term payments deferred uh, up to one year. Uh, unlike the PPP loans, these do need to be repaid. Uh, but again, very reasonable terms and you can apply through sba.gov and that, that all more resources on the EDO loans are on our website. Now these EDO loans also ran out of funding last week and as part of the debate to replenish the PPP funds, Congress is considering adding another $60 billion as part of that program. Uh, that's welcome news for sign and graphics company owners who were unable to land funding the first time around. But again, these funds are going to go quickly once they are once they are official. We will communicate if and when that happens, as soon as it happens. And let me also just let everyone know that businesses can apply for both PPP loans and EDLs, but you can't use both to cover the same expenses. So we've talked about how to keep your sign and graphics company open and the federal tax and loan policies that can help with the economic downturn. And we think that the next step is getting things back on track for your business and for our country's economy. Our country will be returning to work eventually, regardless of when this happens. The planning for it needs to begin now. There are many variables to consider. So we have a survey uh, next on this. Uh, on a, I believe it is on what is your, your biggest concern about reinstating business? Uh, Alicia, is that up? The poll is live on the right-hand side. Just select okay. your option and then click vote. Okay, click start poll. Okay, doesn't look like anyone's voting. Do they need to do? Okay, here we go. Yeah, people are starting. Right. Might just be a little delayed, sorry about that. Oh, no problem. <laughs> it was active on my end, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and we're off. Looks like there are four main concerns about reinstating business. I'll give you a few more seconds to Register your number one concern.
All right. Let's see. Okay, I lost I lost what it was, but I definitely the number one concern was getting finances back on track with 30% and there are a couple other ones. Yeah, David, it was getting the finances back on track at 30%. Um, then there was the next two were tied actually, um, keeping employees safe as well as finding new work and customers. So they were the next two uh, major ones with the other ones just rounding out pretty evenly. Okay, that is good to know. When it comes to reinstating operations and getting our country and our industry started up again, ISA wants to get our industry back to work as quickly, as safely, and as productively as possible. And we're working with groups like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, and government officials to make sure that the sign, graphics, and visual communications industry's needs are considered. And the feedback that we receive from you today and in the future will help us provide valuable input to these policymakers. So to that end, let's have another poll. Okay, it's starting to be appearing any minute on your screen. Okay, and that is that poll is what one topic would you want to learn the most regarding getting back to full operations? So if you hover over it, I think, and click start poll. Yeah, the poll is started. All right. Yep, there it goes. The options are keeping your employees safe and healthy, sales strategies, talent and staff restructuring, supply chain management, financial strategies, and business risk assessment. Okay, I think we're done. And it looks like sales strategies is the number one topic that sign and graphics companies want to learn about regarding getting back to full operations, but also issues such as financial strategies and talent and staff restructuring. Okay, thank you for these feed, the feedback on these two polls regarding reinstating operations. That's going to be our next main goal is for ISA and for contribute for helping sign and graphics companies such as yourselves get back on track. All right, with the bulk of our presentation done, just want to remind everyone that uh, ISA has three more webinars this week, the same time in the same place. Tomorrow we have the one on health and safety for manufacturing facilities that I mentioned earlier. That is uh, featuring um, an expert in industrial hygiene and two sign companies providing their own perspectives. On Thursday, we have crane safety requirements and other OSHA issues that is being presented by uh, ISA's own Kenny Peskin, who's been on this call, speaking knowledgeably about uh, the shutdowns and, and essential business requirements and relationships. Kenny has spent a lot of time over the past couple of years specializing and learning about what sign and graphics companies need to do to become compliant with these OSHA crane safety requirements and other OSHA issues such as um, uh, silica safety and fall protection. And then on Friday, there is working with local officials to get your customers the signs they need. And that is a presentation with um, with two, with two speakers, including Sepna Budev, who is executive director of the Sign Research Foundation and James Carpentier with, with ISA's advocacy team. They're gonna be talking about things that ISA advocacy works on on a regular basis, which is educating local officials, especially planners on how signs are so important to businesses and communities and how the way they regulate them can, uh, can affect communities and and uh, economic development and things like that. So together we can do anything. And what do we mean by that? We mean that signs and graphics companies such as yourselves, if you're not already, you need to join your affiliated association. And you can see that 
Uh, they are split up via the, the state or the region in which you live. Visit signs.org backslash affiliates. You can find out which one is especially for you. Once you join your affiliated association, you automatically become an ISA member and you have access to myself, to Kenny, and to James, to all the other resources that we have, you know, education and workforce development, uh, research papers, white papers, um, and special, special uh, networking events. So speaking of which, what we can't really can't wait for is the 2020 ISA International Sign Expo. As I'm sure you all heard, uh, we've rescheduled the expo from April to August 23rd. It's still, it's still in Orlando, and we hope that all of you are able to come. It's going to be a great show again. So we hope that you are all able to uh, adjust your calendars accordingly and to make it to the Sign Expo 2020 in Orlando. We have registration information there below. Okay, let's